you, Clay, and worship choir. Man, praise the Lord. I'm so thankful that we have Christ-centered worship every single Sunday, lifting up the name of Jesus Christ, who He is, all He's done for us. Man, that'll fill your tank right there. And uh, we've been walking through our core value series, as Clay mentioned earlier, the past few weeks, and I have thoroughly enjoyed uh, being reminded about what we are all about as a church. I've enjoyed uh, sharing about biblical preaching and teaching. That is our foundation. We believe that when we preach God's Word, that He transforms lives. Uh, that when we share God's Word, it will not return void, but it will accomplish all He intends for it to accomplish in our hearts and lives. I'm thankful that we value Christ-centered worship. We just experienced that today. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to myself. And so we do that. We value authentic community. We feel that life is best lived in community with other believers, people that are keeping you accountable, people that are pointing you toward Jesus, people that are up when you're down, and hopefully when they're down, you're up, and you can encourage them and challenge them to walk by faith, not by sight. And so I'm thankful for this community. I'm thankful for my faith family. That's what I like to call our church. It's a faith family. And today, we're going to talk about something that probably makes a lot of people, even Christians, a little uncomfortable, but we value generous giving here at Hopewell Baptist Church. We believe that it's a part of our discipleship. In fact, if you take a look at the logo here on the front of the pulpit, this is a well, and each part of this logo means something. The bottom part means that we're grounded in faith. We want everyone to be grounded in their faith through personal and corporate worship. The three waves represent growing in hope. We want everyone here to be growing in hope through fellowship, there's authentic community, stewardship, and discipleship. We believe that stewardship is a large part of your discipleship. We'll learn more about that today. And then we want everyone to be going in love through gospel service. And that's the roof of the well. And so everything uh, that we believe in, our core values are some summarized in that logo. And today we're going to talk about generous giving. Um, when it comes to money, there are only four things you can do with it. You can give it, you can save it, you can spend it, and you can invest it. That's it. One of those four things, you're going to do one of those four things with your money. And my understanding of money has evolved over time. I remember as a kid uh, thinking that there was really only one purpose in money, and that was to spend it on me right now. And that's what I did with all the money that I got. I remember as a kid when my older sister and I were given a few dollars for doing chores around the house. Immediately, if we could, we would walk a few blocks to the 7-Eleven and we would buy candy for ourselves. We would spend all of our money. I mean, we would start with the big stuff and then we would end up with the little stuff. We would try to spend every little nickel that we had on candy for ourselves. If we were feeling generous, we would pull our resources together and buy candy that could be divided between both of us. Like we'd buy Skittles or sweet tarts or bottle caps. You remember those? And we'd open them up and we'd dump them on the table and we'd count. Here's two for you, two for me, two for you. And we'd end up with a smorgasbord of candy. Now, when, uh, when things were really going well and we were really flush with cash, we would skip the 7-Eleven altogether and we would go to Dairy Queen. And my sister would get a Dilly Bar. I would get a Buster Bar. Or if we were really rolling, you know, in the cash, I would get a peanut buster parfait. That was my favorite. I know, I, I bear witness with many of you out there today. <laughs> Is there a Dairy Queen close by? I don't know. Well, we'll check into that. But as I grew older, especially after getting married, I began to understand the importance of saving, preparing for those rainy days, for those unexpected emergencies. I also realized the importance of giving. Uh, my wife and I started giving to our local church. Every time we were paid, we would give a tithe to our local church. 10% off the top. It was a discipline uh, that reminded us that everything we have comes from God. Of course, we heard uh, tithing preached our whole lives, and so we started to implement that, and it was a real blessing to us. In fact, we were so committed that we just assumed that first 10% of whatever God had given us was His. It wasn't ours. It was his. And if we spent that 10%, it would be like robbing God. And so every time we received a check, we did the simple math and we gave God 10%. And you know, God blessed that. 
I'd always heard that if you, if you, you know, give God the first and the best, he'll bless the rest. But if you don't give God the first and the best, then the rest will be cursed. And I truly believe that. God blessed us. And we were always humbled at the end of the year when we would get our giving statement back from the church as to how much we were really able to give to the Lord. And, um, and so we were challenged that, hey, let's try to give a little bit more. Let's don't just stop at the 10%. Let's increase our percentage. And I wish I could tell you that today, after almost 28 years of marriage, that we give over half of our income away. We're not there yet, okay? But we did leave 10% a long time ago, and God was so faithful to bless the rest, to honor him with the first and the best, and to live on the rest. We discovered quickly that giving a prioritized percentage of our increase regularly reminds us of our true provider. It's not me. It's not even my employer. It's God. God is the source of everything. And I'm starting to learn that it's not the size of our giving that God is concerned with. He's interested in the sacrifice of our giving, the heart. And you know, when you think about it, really, I I named four ways to, to use money, give, save, spend, invest. Really, if you think about it, all four of those things could just be called investment. We're making investments. Uh, when we do any of those things, because Webster defines investment as the outlay of money, usually for income or profit. Forbes says investing is the process of buying assets that increase in value over time and provides return in the form of income payments or capital gains. And then Forbes said in a larger sense, investing can also be about spending time or money to improve your own life or the lives of others. And so when you think about it, all four things that you do with money is an investment. It's an investment. That makes us investors, all right? No matter how old you are, no matter what your income is, you are an investor. And so when you invest your money by giving it away, you're investing in someone or something, and the return on your investment is you feel good about yourself because you've helped someone or you've done something good. When you invest your money by saving money, you're providing for some unknown future need. And the return on your investment is that when the need actually does arise, you're able to take care of it without going into debt. That's your return on investment. When you spend your money, you're investing in something that you want or need. And the return on that investment is is the product that you can enjoy or that makes your life easier. These are all investments that give you return. And so if you think of everything we do with money as an investment, and we are all investors, then we need some financial advisement, don't we? And I am not qualified for that. And so let's look at someone who is. What if I told you that the one who created everything that has ever been bought or sold since the beginning of time, the one who created the greatest financial minds who have ever Live the one of whom it is said that all things are of him and through him and will be eventually to him. What if I told you that you could ask him for financial advice on how you invest your resources? Well, you can. He's already given it to us. Let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, that's where we'll be today. We're going to look specifically at verses 19 through 21. Now, this passage of Scripture is part of a greater segment of Scripture entitled the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus preached to a large crowd that had gathered to hear him on a mountain. Thus, it's the Sermon on the Mount, right? This would be the sermon in a building, I guess. I don't know. But this is part of it. And in this sermon, Jesus covers all kinds of topics. But one of the things he talks quite a bit about, especially here in chapter 6, is money. Maybe some of these phrases will ring a bell from Matthew chapter 6. Jesus saying, when you do a charitable deed, do not let your hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. Maybe you're familiar with what many call the Lord's Prayer, where Jesus says, give us this day our daily bread. That's how we're supposed to pray. How about this statement? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon or money. This is one of my favorites, and I memorized it. Matthew 6.33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things, the things that we worry about, all these things will be added unto you, but you put him first. 
So we could look at all of those things. But today I wanted to focus on verses 19 through 21 of chapter 6, where Jesus, the creator and the sustainer of all things, gives some crystal clear financial advice for all of us investors. So let's stand together as we read Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Father, we thank you for this incredible instruction from the one who made all. Jesus, you were there in the beginning. You spoke the world into existence. Everything that we have comes from you. There's no one better to ask on how we use the resources you provide. Jesus, give us wisdom today from your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So in this passage, Jesus gives us three reminders regarding our investments. First, he reminds us about, number one, the risk of earthly investment. Very simple. There's a great risk that comes along with your earthly investment. Anytime you make an investment, it's wise to calculate the risk. And Jesus, the creator of all things, says that investing on earth has its risks. And those risks have to do with bugs, bolts, and bandits. He said moths can eat it. Moths can eat it. If you invest on earth, moths can eat it. You know, I bought this new shirt this week. But I knew when I bought it that it would eventually be an old shirt. You know, I'll wear it and I'll enjoy it for a little while and then it'll work its way to the back of my rotation and it'll end up being in that part of my closet that I never go to anymore. You know what I'm talking about. And then one day I'll do a, a cleaning of my closet and I'll give this shirt away and then somebody else may enjoy it for a little while. But eventually, all material things will end up moth-eaten. Somebody will have to throw it away or tear it up and use it for rags. I'm using it now, but eventually it'll wear out. It'll wear and waste away. Moths will eat it. Everything on earth has a temporary lifespan. Life, lifespan. All material things fade and can become moth-eaten. So Jesus just matter-of-factly says, moths can eat it. The second risk is that rust can destroy it. Jesus doesn't just point out the risk associated with material things. He even reminds us, the risk with structural things. Rust destroys them. I'm no scientist, but I know that when water and air meet metal, a thing called oxi oxygenation happens, and it's not good. I think it's not oxygenation, it's oxidization, I think, anyway. But it will erode it. It's bad news. It's bad news. Uh, do we have pictures of those rusty cars, by the way? Maybe not. Maybe not. Okay, you guys have seen cars that were beautiful in their day and everybody desired them, they wanted them, they saved up money to own them, but then those owners uh, pass away and, and whoever they give those cars to doesn't care as much and they just kind of leave them out in the rain and then they just become lawn ornaments. Rust deteriorates them, it destroys them, it weakens them, it erodes them. Many of you have beautiful antique cars in our church and you show them regularly. And you, of all people, know how difficult it is to maintain those vehicles, to keep them pristine. And guess what? One day, when you don't feel like doing that anymore, if somebody buys that automobile that doesn't care about it as much as you do, eventually, it will be worn away. It will rust. It will erode. It will become undesirable. Whether they're Teslas or Toyotas, they all meet the same demise. Eventually. And not only do you have to worry about bugs and bolts, there's also bandits around. Jesus said moths will eat it, rust will destroy it, and thieves can steal it. Those are the risks of earthly investment. It's risky. One of the things I've noticed is that when you own expensive things, you become obsessed with keeping those things safe. You buy security systems, you build fences, you buy locks, because there are always people who want what you have. And I've noticed a trend where you go from obsessing to get something and then you 
switch to obsessing to keep something. That's the way it is with earthly investments. But you need to know that we live on a fallen planet with fallen people who are out to get as much as they can, can as much as they get, and sit on the can and spoil the rest for anybody else who might want their stuff. That's the way it is. Whether it's blue-collar criminals who break into your house and steal your car or white-collar criminals who cheat you of your retirement savings or trick you into a bad business deal, the risk is high. There are always selfish sinners who will try to sneak off with what you work so hard to save. So many sad stories of money managers that were hired to protect investments who steal it away. And all of that money that you work so hard to accumulate disappears, it's gone. Jesus says, know the risk. When you invest on earth, it's risky business. Risky business. Ponzi schemes where individuals defraud investors of their life savings. Whether you store your money under the mattress or keep your money in an account, Jesus said there are no guarantees. There's no guaranteed security in this sin sick society. I put a phrase in your bulletin. It's a little depressing, but it's so true. Every earthly investment must be managed and maintained. Basically, more stuff, more stress. Right? Yeah. That's the bad news. And I, I can tell you're feeling that, right? You're like, wow, thanks a lot. Not only is it raining, not only is my team not in the Super Bowl, but now you're just making me sad and depressed, preacher. What am I supposed to do then? What am I supposed to do? Well, Jesus gives us some good news. He gives us an alternative to earthly investments. In verse 20, the reward of heavenly investment. So we see, number one, the risk of earthly investment in verse 19. Number two, we see the reward of heavenly investment. He said, but lay up for yourselves, still for yourself, but it's treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. So while there are countless risks to earthly investment, there are many rewards to heavenly investments. All heavenly investments earn interest that compounds for eternity. You know, as I thought of this idea of heavenly interest compounding, I thought, what is heaven interested in? What is heaven interested in? And I came up with a few things. Because, you know, when I say, and when Jesus says you should lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, how do we do that? Well, we support and we invest in things that heaven is interested in, and then we earn heavenly interest. What is heaven interested in? Well, a few things. The church. The church. The bride of Christ. The church includes the souls of men, women, boys, and girls, all for whom Christ died. You think that's important to God? Yeah. You think heaven is interested in the souls of men? The Bible tells us that the angels rejoice when a person trusts in Jesus. Jesus loves his bride. He loves her. He gave himself for her. And so the church, the souls of men, women, boys, and girls, God's word, heaven is interested in God's word. God's word will never pass away. It's the way that God chose to reveal himself to mankind. Do you think he's interested in preserving, protective, and, dis and, and distributing his word all around the world? I, I should say so. He's interested in the church. He's interested in his word. He's interested in the helpless, orphans and widows. He cares for them. And he commanded us to care for them. And so those are the things that heaven is interested in. And anytime you give or invest generously to meet the needs of any of those entities, you are supporting what God is interested in. That's the way that you lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And there are three wonderful promises when you invest in heaven. The first is it is protected. Something that you can never do on earth, God can do for you in heaven. In heaven's storehouses, there are no moths, there are no rust, and the bank of heaven has never been and never will be robbed of its contents. 
God protects your resources. Your heavenly investment is not backed by the FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. They're backed by Almighty God. He keeps your investment safe. I love 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 4 through 5. It says that all who believe in Jesus, we have an inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for us. That sounds like it's protected to me. How about you? Incorruptible. It's undefiled. It does not fade away. It is reserved in heaven. But not only is your heavenly investment protected, it is also preserved. Verse 5 in 1 Peter 1 says, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Your heavenly investment is eternally secure just like you are in Christ. Anything you give him is secure. It's being kept for you. No market crash will carry it away. No rate hike will rip you off. No Ponzi scheme will part you from it. It is protected. It is preserved. So many rewards by laying your treasures up in heaven, but also it's productive. By investing in heaven's interest, you're investing in something that lasts forever. The church will last forever. The beloved bride of Christ lasts forever. The buildings won't last forever, but the bride will last forever. It's eternal. We will rule and reign with Jesus forever. The souls of men who hear and believe the gospel from the work of the church will become a part of that church that lasts forever. And according to Jesus, his word will never pass away either in Matthew 24 and 35. You know, earthly companies come and go. The earthly things we invest in, everything on earth has a shelf life, including shelves. They have, I'm sorry, that was a bad dad joke. But everything on earth will eventually pass away. Jesus said it will be moth-eaten, it will be rust destroyed, thieves can break in and steal. But when we lay up treasures for ourselves in heaven, it will be protected, preserved, it will be productive. When the Apostle Paul began to follow Jesus, his perspective was drastically changed. He said in Philippians 3, 7 and 8, he said, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of knowledge of Christ, for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. All the things that I had that I've lost for Christ, I count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. Without exception, every possession you treasure, every bank balance you enjoy will one day be left behind. This is an old preacher joke, but it's so true. I have never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. It just doesn't happen. As one who participates in funerals all the time, I, I just never see the person that is deceased taking any of their stuff with them. It just doesn't happen. You can't take it with you. In the end, always someone else will deal with your stuff. Well, Jesus closes this mention of money by giving us a reality check in verse 21. I love this. This is the summary behind everything that Jesus says. He says in verse 21, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I put a statement in your notes that is so true. Investments either disclose or determine the direction of your affection. It's the way you know and everyone around you knows what's important to you. Your investments. You know, without knowing you, someone could study your bank statements and figure out what is important to you. They could quickly assess that about you. Where you invest your money discloses your affection. You may say what's important to you, but your bank account reveals what's important to you. It's true. If you were to look at the Wenger family's bank statement, you would discover three things pretty quickly. Number one, we love Hopewell Baptist Church. Number two, we love our four kids. God bless them. Number three, 
We value education. Those are three things that you would catch right away if you looked at the Wenger's bank statement. What would we discover about you? What would we say that you value if we looked at your bank statement? Last month, those of you who gave through Hopewell Baptist Church, you laid up treasures in heaven through Hopewell. You received a bank statement, end of year giving, not a bank statement, end of year giving statement through Hopewell for your tax purposes so you could mark charitable giving. I always like to challenge people with this question. If you were to take your charitable giving from last year, multiply it by 10, would you receive, and that would become your salary for 2024, would you, would you receive a raise? Would you take a pay cut? Or would we all be impressed with your meticulous math skills? Because it is down to the penny, 10%. That's just a thought. Would you get a raise? Would you take a pay cut? Or will we, will we be impressed with the meticulous detail of your math? Either way, that test discloses the direction of your affection. When you give a prioritized percentage of your paycheck regularly, it will remind you of your true provider. It keeps possessions in their proper place every time. And when it comes to God and giving, he's always more interested in your motive than your money. It's true. It's not really about the size of the gift. It's about the sacrifice of the giver. He doesn't care about your dollar. He wants your devotion. How do you know that, Pastor? Well, in Luke chapter 21, verses 1 through 4, the gospel writer tells us a story of Jesus and his disciples at the temple. They were watching as people gave their offerings. And he looked up, it says, and he saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow putting in two mites. A mite in our day would be worth about an eighth of a cent. And so this poor widow puts in two mites. And Jesus says to the disciples, truly I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all. For all these, out of their abundance, have put in offerings for God, but she, out of her poverty, put in all the livelihood that she had. Do you think that God took care of that widow that day? Oh, yeah. She didn't use her two mites to invest in earthly things. She said, I'm going to lay up treasures in heaven. And I bet that interest was compounded. I think God took care of the widow Charles Spurgeon said, a jealous God will not be content with a divided heart. He must be loved first and best. That's what God wants. He wants our heart. And he wants it to mean something. He wants it. He wants us to feel something. David said in 2 Samuel 24, 24, I will not offer to the Lord my God sacrifices that have cost me nothing. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. 1 Corinthians 16, 2, on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. On Sunday, put God first. Give him the best. C.S. Lewis once said, there ought to be things we'd like to do, but cannot because our charitable expenditures exclude them. I'm not going to lie. Growing up, As my views on money evolved and being married to my wife and having a growing family and only one income, we would often think about that amount that we give, the first and the best, that 10%. And every now and then, on tough times, we'd be like, man, wow, I wonder what we could do with that, you know? Why are things so tight? Well, it's because we give this amount away. Hmm. But we never went back on it. We just said, Lord, you know how we feel. You know how we're thinking. This money isn't ours. It belongs to you. And we trust that you'll bless the rest. And he always did. He always has. He always will. You know, death will eventually pry open your hands and take away your stuff and give it to other people. It's going to happen to each and every one of us. So, I challenge you, do your giving while you're living so you're knowing where it's going, right? Lay up for yourself 
treasures in heaven where moth does not eat it, where rust cannot destroy it, where thieves can never break in and steal it. You know, it's okay to have things. Just don't let things have you. Money's not the root of evil. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. Be invested in what God is interested in. In closing today, I want to take a moment to celebrate your generous giving as a church. I'm not here to beat you up. I'm here to inspire you to be be obedient to what God's called you to do. And so many of you are, and I'm telling you, in the last two and a half years, as pastor of Hope Baptist Church, we've not only met our annual budget, we've exceeded our annual budget. More money has come in than we have budgeted for, and that's an incredible praise. Even in increasing our budget every year, we've exceeded it. We've also paid cash for three phases of renovation. You know, we paid cash for phases one and two, which was $225,000 in addition to meeting and exceeding our budget. That was the first year I was here. The second year, we had enough left over at the end of the year to complete phase three of renovations. That was $340,000. That's how much renovations happen here. It's incredible. Not only that, but we've spent $50,000 updating our children's ministry area. You need to go down and look at it. If you don't have kids in there, we'll give you a quick peek, okay? You can't go into the secure areas, but take a look. It's awesome. The kids are loving it. I'm so excited about it. We have replaced a bunch of old AC units that would have cost us a quarter of a million dollars. But guess what? We had it. And so we did it. That's why it's a little cool in here this morning. <laughs> we, we put a new sign on our church so that people driving by on 60 can see across and see that we're Hopewell Baptist Church. We not only fixed our own AC, but we've, gave, we've given another church in our community $50,000 to fix their AC. Man, it's exciting. We've saved almost $200,000 for an upcoming portico project, a dry drop-off. Wouldn't that have been nice to pull under this morning? Coming soon. But what I'm really excited is about is we're able to gift our missionaries and ministries even more money at the end of the year from our surplus and be a special blessing to them. We gave $13,000 toward the purchase of a truck for a national pastor in Cambodia. We started a nutrition center that feeds 40 kids a day, two meals a day, five days a week, doing all of this. We simultaneously retired $830,000 of principal debt. Isn't that amazing? I'm telling you, yeah, praise God. And then in one hour this past Sunday at our dessert auction, we raised $8,000 for kids to go to camp. All of our kids will go to student camp for $25 a piece. That's amazing. My wife's cinnamon roll sold for $950. I'll be honest with you. I haven't appreciated them as much as I should have. I should relish every single bite. But you know that we can't do this alone. I can't do that alone. You can't do that alone. We're all a part of it. It's because everybody in our church, from all socioeconomic backgrounds, has done their piece. They've given a piece of their puzzle. We have have little kids tithing off their income. We have students that write a tithe check. Or they give online. They don't write checks. They give online. We have young adults tithing off of their increase. It's not as big as some other tithes, but every little piece is being stored up. And then God, because we're giving to what he's interested in, he's like, I'm going to compound this interest. I'm going to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think, according to my riches and my resources. It's awesome to be a part of that. This year, we're gathering prices to figure out how much it's going to cost to renovate this space, to get this up to speed with everything else. And it's going to be the biggest number. And I'm a little stressed about it. Oh, me of little faith. Because I know it's going to cost a lot of money. But God has been faithful up to this point. What makes me think that he couldn't do the next thing? And the thing after that. And the thing after that. He's so good. In fact, I planned to preach this message uh, several months ago, but our daily reading through the Bible and the Bible project, today we were in Exodus 36 where the people are bringing their offerings for the construction of the sanctuary, right? 
And what happens? All of the artisans that are building, they have too much stuff coming in, too much gold, too much silver, too much fine fabrics. And they're like, whoa, whoa, Moses, tell the people to stop giving. This is more than enough. Isn't that awesome? I want to be a more than enough giver who's a part of a more than enough church to glorify a more than enough God. And that's possible because God is faithful. He doesn't expect a certain size gift, but he wants us to sacrifice. He wants us to feel that he is our source, that from him comes every good thing that we enjoy. Exodus 30, Exodus 36, 5, and they spoke to Moses saying, the people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded us to do. So Moses gave a commandment and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp saying, let neither man nor woman do any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. And the people were restrained from bringing. Imagine that. We're not going to do an offering this morning because good grief, people. You just need to cut it out. You're giving too much. Back off. Wouldn't it be incredible if everyone was so generous for Jesus that they had to be restrained from giving? Let's stand together for a time of invitation today. What is your application to these reminders from Jesus today? Maybe you spent all your time investing in earth. Pretty risky. Pretty risky. But maybe it's time to start laying up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Or moss can't eat it. Rust can't destroy it. Thieves can't steal it. Imagine how freeing that is. Lord, I'm giving it to you. It's yours anyway. Now protect it. Preserve it. And Lord, make it productive. He's good at that. He took a young boy's lunch and started breaking it and blessing it. And it fed 5,000 people with 12 baskets left over. You may not think your gift is much, but the old Southern Gospel song says little is much when God is in it, right? It's time to start investing in heaven. Maybe you're here and you've been faithfully giving all these years. So much so, it's just automatic. And maybe you've forgotten about it. It's so automatic, you don't even think about it anymore. God doesn't want that either. He wants you to think about it. He wants you to bring it. He wants you to feel it. I was so encouraged. First time I ever preached on money as your new pastor, I was nervous, as you can imagine. People get funny when you talk about money. And when I preached the very first message on money, one of our faithful men in the church said, Pastor, we're debt-free. We give faithfully. God has blessed us above anything we can imagine. And we give. But I'll be honest with you, it's become so automatic, I don't even think about it anymore. And so we had a conversation, my wife and I, and we're going to give more. We're going to stretch. We're going to increase that percentage until we can feel it. Because I want to see God do something cool. I want to stretch my faith. Isn't that great? That's called discipleship, right? That's why it's one of those waves. We believe that we will grow in hope through our fellowship with one another, our stewardship of all that God has given, and our discipleship, walking more like Jesus, trusting him more and more every day. So maybe that's you. Maybe you've seen that God can use the remaining 90% of your income to take care of you. Do you think he could use 88% or 85% or 80% of your income to take care of you? Just a thought. Maybe God's given you more resources, not to increase your standard of living, but to raise your level of giving. Just a thought. It's a test of your trust. God is all about your heart. He wants your devotion. So in a few moments, we're going to sing. And if you're here this morning, you want to come and spend some time in prayer. Just thank God for all he's done, all he's given. You know, the greatest gift that God has ever given us isn't the resources that support us. It's his only son to save us. If you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus is your savior. Take this opportunity to come forward. We would love to show you from God's word how you can know without a doubt that your sins are forgiven, 
you've been set free and that you can enjoy a relationship with the one who made you. If you need to get saved, come and do that today. But let's do business with the Lord. Let's take Jesus at his word. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Father, we thank you for your word. Jesus, we thank you for these pointed, simple truths. Lord, your advice to us as investors is is really simple, but sometimes it's not easy. So many things battle for our affections. Lord, I pray that we would put you first, give you the best today. Thank you for all you've done through Hopewell and through your faithful people, Lord. We, we trust that you'll do even more as we trust in you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you need to come and pray, please come and pray.